Today's talk is entitled, What is Neoanthroposophy? Now that brings a smile to my face because I think we should be able to explain that to you since we coined the term recently. And we coined the term because we found it to be a great necessity in our modern age. First, let us go back and explain what is anthroposophy. And then we will look at why it is there have been so many different names for the being who has inspired anthroposophy over time. And then see how that translates into our modern times, 90 years after the death of Rudolf Steiner. Rudolf Steiner was the founder of anthroposophy, but he wasn't the first person to use that name. Uh, Eugenius Thalelefes and uh, Thomas Vaughn and a number of other people used the name before he did. What it means is anthropo is the name for the human being or man. And Sophia is the ancient name that goes back in time just about as far as anyone can imagine and is one of the deepest names that we can encounter, Sophia. We'll go into that in just a minute. But Anthroposophia, as created by Rudolf Steiner, was an offshoot of Theosophy. And again, there's that word at the end, Sophia. Theosophy was, in 1875, founded by H.P. Blavatsky, a wonderful character in the spiritual uh, world uh, of America who came and looked at all the different spiritual scientists that were working as uh, people doing seances and uh, table tapping and every other thing. But she had an incredible capacity, an incredible mind, and an incredible memory. She had traveled the world as a woman, which in her time was unheard of, and in 1875 wrote the book Isis Unveiled. This book kicked open the doors of Western thinkers to start thinking in the terms of Eastern thinkers. And when her profound work, The Secret Doctrine, was written after that, it again was at its time the most profound work of philosophy and religion out of the East, merged with the West, that anyone had ever seen. The tenets of theosophy, as created by Ovatsky, were to merge science, art, and religion into one way of thinking, one philosophy. So that's what theosophy was in the modern terms. Rudolf Steiner came to theosophy and was one of their lead teachers, especially in Germany. Uh, he did not know H.P. Blavatsky, but he did know many other great theosophists who had clustered around him. And he himself studied theosophy. He was a member of the esoteric section and was uh, a card-carrying theosophist. He led the uh, German society uh, in 1905, became the head of it in Berlin with his wife, Marie von Sivers. And from that, he took odds with the leader of the Theosophical Society after Blavatsky, whose name was Annie Besant. And he didn't like what she was teaching, basically. She was teaching more Eastern philosophy. He was teaching Christian philosophy. So they broke and Rudolf Steiner created his own society called Anthroposophy. Now, Rudolf Steiner once said that there were three sources to Anthroposophy. First and foremost is the work of Novalis. Novalis is the pen name for the great romantic philosopher and writer uh, Frederick von Hardenberg. He believed that Novalis had laid the foundation for what later he was to build as his work of Anthroposophy. And he said that was the second source of the teachings of Anthroposophy was all the work that he did for those many years before and during the time that he had been a Theosophist and later an Anthroposophist. But he said the third source of Anthroposophy was the being Anthroposophia. Now this being in Rudolf Steiner's mind is a being who goes back far in time as I mentioned before. In ancient times, before 2000 BC, she was known as Isis in Egypt, as Ishtar in Mesopotamia. Later, through the Hebrews, she was known as Hakma, or the being of Sophia, the being of wisdom. And later, for the Greeks, she was known as Philosophia. In other words, the love of wisdom, those who sought after wisdom as if they loved her. And then later, in Europe, philosophy was continued out of the philosophy of the Greeks. And then we have in modern times the Theosophical Society that I've spoken of, and later Anthroposophy. But now Neo-Anthroposophy would be a resurrection, a new form of Anthroposophy. It is not 
a form that is going to ignore the previous manifestations of the being of Sophia. It's a new vision built upon the a priori assumption that what Rudolf Steiner gave as his anthroposophy is correct, and that there's really no need to argue about it. One can either read the 400 books of Rudolf Steiner or simply leave him out of the question and the dialogue, because if you do not study Steiner thoroughly, it shows in everything you have to say about what you think Rudolf Steiner has said. So neo-anthroposophy is a living modern commentary, not only on anthroposophy, but on the being of Sophia. So we find in the Gospel of Sophia that the author has given us a new view of this literally being, almost a human being, that Rudolf Steiner calls the Holy Sophia. In the third part of that book, of the Gospel of Sophia, is a timeline in history showing quotations from all of the great sacred writers and texts that go back as far as we have written texts. And it shows this development of this being who one could say is the composite of the spiritual and intellectual development of mankind. Rudolf Steiner, in his book, The Riddles of Philosophy, describes this being more accurately than anyone else has ever done, and says that she grows alongside of mankind, and that she is in every way truly human, but that she has no physical body. She is not limited by that. He describes how, as individual thinkers developed through philosophy, that they were, in fact, describing their relationship with this being, Sophia. We can see that in their texts. We can see descriptions of their love affair, in some cases, with this being, that they gave up everything, their wife, their children, their kingdom, so that they could seek this being. This is a very real being. This is, as we might say, the collective consciousness of the developing humankind, both spiritually and intellectually. We can follow her path, as is found in the Gospel of Sophia, very clearly as she develops her different bodies up from the past up to the present and even into the future. Sophia is the closest companion that we have on our spiritual path. She is the midwife of our spiritual self. She is the one who prepares our soul to be the Virgin Sophia. All of these things Rudolf Steiner said. But there are things in Gospel of Sophia that go a little bit further than Rudolf Steiner had pointed out in his indications and his teachings. But that is where neo-anthroposophy draws the line of demarcation. Any time that an author wishes to speak beyond Rudolf Steiner, that's fine. You quote Steiner up to a certain point, you refer to his ideas, and then you clearly state where your ideas then go further or separate from or perhaps do not agree with Rudolf Steiner. Rudolf Steiner and many other spiritual scientists have pointed out that in our time, we must have our own North Star. We must guide our own ship and we must find our own path. At one point, Rudolf Steiner said, we are in fact, each individual, a religion of one. We are the church. We are the Pope. We are the congregation. And perhaps there won't be another person who believes what we believe. Therefore, as we use the term Sophia or the being of Sophia and the great inspirations that she's given over time, we can see how that fits in to a perspective of evolution of human consciousness. And then we can find how we relate to her. Because one thing is for sure, Rudolf Steiner was a clairvoyant who directly contacted the spiritual world. He was in direct contact with the being of Sophia. He said that during the laying of the first foundation stone of the first Gertianum, that the being of Anthroposophia was in the room physically with them, and that anyone who had eyes to see her could see her. He said that again on numerous occasions, that she was a physical being that was present in meetings or in lectures that he gave. She is not a philosophical idea. She is not an amorphous um, subconscious or collective unconscious like Jung's ideas. Sophia is a real being. And in the Gospel of Sophia, neo-anthroposophy actually came to birth, though there was no name at that time for it. But when the, when the author of the Gospel of Sophia indicated that Rudolf Steiner himself even said there was a mother goddess, 
and that she was in fact the combination of all the efforts of the nine hierarchies. He said there was a, another being named Sophia who came from the ranks of the beings of wisdom, the Kyriotides, and that there was a third being, and that being he called uh, Sophia or the Holy Sophia, and that she evolved over time, that she only came to the earth at a certain time and evolved over time and is the helpmate, the midwife of the spiritual birth of each individual. And she works together with the Holy Spirit. She is the being Sophia Christos. This is the revelation of the Gospel of Sophia. Rudolf Steiner said that in our time it was not enough to know Christ, but we needed to know the wisdom of Christ, the wisdom of the cosmic Christ, and specifically the wisdom of the cosmic Christ that manifests in the etheric realm at this time. That is experienced through something called etheric vision, which we will address on another talk. But when we say Neoanthroposophy, we can actually also think Sophia Christos, because they would be one and the same in terms of what our definition of Neoanthroposophy is. So we build on the work of Rudolf Steiner. And there are people now who, instead of making a clear demarcation between Steiner's teachings and what they have to say or what they wish to add on to Rudolf Steiner, or in some cases they use the term go beyond Rudolf Steiner, I would only warn that it is very hard to go beyond the teachings of Anthroposophy. One can take the teachings of Rudolf Steiner and look closely at them and find that there are some things he did not crystallize, as one might say, there were uh, dots that there were no lines connecting them. And when you connect those dots, sometimes you see things that he obviously meant to say. That is not going beyond Anthroposophy. That is simply being a commentator on the complete works of Rudolf Steiner. That is quite different than what we see in some teachers nowadays who say that they know more than Rudolf Steiner did, that they have gone to the Akashic Records, that they have clairvoyance, and that they have a difference of opinion than Rudolf Steiner. They're anthroposophists with a new view, but that view is different than Rudolf Steiner's. And when one does not make the clear demarcation and tries to insinuate that what they are adding, which is different than Rudolf Steiner's teachings, to anthroposophy and using a platform of anthroposophy, I would not call that anthroposophy at all. I would call that false flag anthroposophy. That is someone trying to draw you in through the amazing insight and wisdom of Rudolf Steiner and then try to stamp that as their own or try to say that they know more than Rudolf Steiner or they have insight into who was who in a previous incarnation or even more likely in today's age that this individual who's giving a new teaching is in fact Rudolf Steiner reincarnated. Those types of speculation do not belong in Neoanthroposophy in the way that we look at it. Neoanthroposophy has a foundation of anthroposophy. You cannot take a 25% foundation of anthroposophy and start to glue things onto it and think that it still has a cohesive, coherent cosmology, because it will not. There was one Rudolf Steiner, and to my knowledge, there has been no one who made more scientific predictions that have now been proven. I know of no one who has renovated so many different uh, and, and re-enlivened so many different fields of knowledge. So we must give Steiner his due. We must give anthroposophy its due. But we can leave behind all the accoutrements that have come with that since he appointed no successor. And now it stands on its own. But that does not mean we can't use it as a foundation to build new temples of wisdom.